let me cite here my favorite saying from Lord Kelvin. Around 1885, he is quoted to have said, you know, heavier than air flying machines will never be possible. And that was just 10 years removed from, from you know, the first flight actually commencing. So whatever, whatever we look at and whatever we see today as the complete picture is com- constantly changing. Welcome to The Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. Today's episode is a conversation with Balaj Erde. Balaj is founder of Green Urbanics, a marketplace and blog for innovative nature-based urban sustainability solutions. He has a long career in business development and innovation, but with a background in ecology. His mission is to support regenerative businesses and bring the best solutions directly to city governments and other clients so they can quickly deploy them and take action on climate change. This episode will be a great resource for those of you looking for existing solutions, existing innovations to aspects of the climate crisis in urban areas. Balaj explains a ton of great examples of these, including ancient architectural techniques through to low-tech solutions, as well as some of the more exciting high-tech solutions. And then there's also those technologies that are there to kind of influence our mindset and bring about this kind of um, uh, shift in consumer uh, consumer behavior and that kind of thing, which is also a really interesting side of it. Um, we talk about that the specific examples in the second half of the episode, um, and there are direct links to all the companies and products we talk about in the episode description. So that should be useful. If there's anything in there you find interesting, you can just go... Uh, straight there if you look in the show notes uh, or the episode description. In the first half of the episode, we discuss more of the conceptual side, talking about the importance of getting business working on innovative climate solutions, how governments could incentivize that, and moving beyond sustainability to a regenerative approach. Being someone whose career revolves around you know, working with local authorities and urban design consulting and education, I definitely have blind spots when it comes to the role of other types of business, startups, manufacturing in the climate crisis. So it's so great to talk to someone like Balaj, who comes from that world, and to learn from him. I definitely think it is part of the puzzle of achieving our environmental targets. And it also busts that myth that moving towards sustainability is bad for business. Actually, there is a lot of money to be made in innovative green solutions, and it gives me hope that to see the market shifting in that direction. You can learn more about what Blage is doing at greenurbanics.com. Um, there's also an event coming up in September that he is running, uh, which will showcase some of these innovative solutions. You can find, you can register for that at greenurbanics.com. Uh, I'm going to be there. Uh, It's going to be really interesting, I think. Um, Otherwise, you can catch up with him on LinkedIn. Just search for his name or check out the show description for the episode description for a link to that. You can also follow The Green Urbanist on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. There, uh, as always, social media links are in the description. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Balaj. Thank you so much, Balaj, for joining me here on the Green Urbanist podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Ab- absolute pleasure. Um, please tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, and what you do. So uh, my name is uh, Balaj Erdei, and I hail from uh, Budapest, Hungary, but I consider myself pretty much a global citizen, especially in today's world where uh, the climate emergency is uh, pretty much uh, our present and not something far away in the future. I'm an ecologist by trade, but I uh, kept on studying and uh, got sucked into uh, public policy and innovation. I was even a uh, science diplomat back in the days, science and technology attaché. 
and uh, actually that's where I learned most of what I uh, <clears throat> what I know now. But I uh, pretty much uh, spent the last decade and a half helping innovation, bringing together the uh, research triangle, you know, research universities, uh, corporate innovators, and small scale entrepreneurs along innovation projects. And in the last uh, couple of years, I decided to focus my uh, ex- experience, network, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, efforts into the very the most important uh, cross section of innovation and climate technology, because I feel that uh, you know besides uh, besides just making a living, it's important. Uh, for my for my children, you know, to be able to look into their eyes in let's say twenty years and say, I was one of those who uh, was trying to do something uh, about the climate emergency. So it sounds like an incredible uh, resume of of experience. Do you, mm-hmm. do you what sort of influence did your ecology background have on moving into innovation and, and technology? Even though I never worked a minute in uh, ecology itself, it gives me <laughs> it gives me a perspective perspective of um, you know how to how to approach human environment, but also nature in a holistic approach. Um, there's lots of things that on paper or on, uh, at a first glance look good. Typical example, mm. planting trees. How nice that is. I mean, that's nature's way of absorbing carbon. But that can be, you know, some in some cases more harmful than, uh, than good if you do it the wrong way. So... If you try to to uh, advance sustainable uh, sustainable approaches and regenerative efforts, it's very important to always think in complex ecosystems. It's never the tree that gets planted; it's always the natural ecosystem that can uh, that can help uh, both the human population and the future of our planet. The most important ecosystems that can be our aids are of course, rainforests and natural, uh, at the the end of the succession, natural forests, peatlands, Mm -hmm. and coastal mangroves, coastal ecosystems, besides besides the the marine uh, ecosystems. So when you have when you have this background of, um, you know, looking, looking at the world in a complex picture, I think it helps sort out some of the uh, some of the well intended um, moves that some Mm -hmm that some deem as a sufficient, but I like to, I like to uh, take it a step further. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's talk in the UK of, of adding a basic ecology course, I think for all primary school students, um, which I think is a fantastic idea to give them that understanding, particularly those who are growing up in cities, actually, how does the natural world work? It's not as simple as often we think it is. Absolutely. Much more complex. Absolutely, the UK is leading is leading in many sense when it comes to regenerating nature and uh, connecting uh, urban centers with nature. But I can give you another example there: pollinators. There's a huge problem everybody knows about, you know, the decline of pollinators and the many threats that they face. But there was one corporate scheme that was helping farmers, you know, expand on honeybee colonies and hives. And if you look at it from a from a global or from a broader perspective from ecology from an ecological standpoint that that is also well intentioned well intended but at the same time the natural pollinators are the ones that are really in decline it's not it's Mm. not honeybees that's just one species there's Mm. like hundreds of other species of bees and bumblebees and pollinators that need our help and it needs again a holistic integrative effort Mm. Um, can you tell me a bit about uh, what is green urbanics? Absolutely. Green urbanics um, <clears throat> is a consultancy and a website pretty much under construction right now, but close to uh, getting it uh, up and running, where it's going to be a blog and an online marketplace ah, okay. for all kinds of nature-based, bio-inspired, eco-friendly and clean tech solutions we are aiming at you know spreading the best examples best practices from around the world and helping you know our demand side which is green urban planners 
municipality officials, corporate sustainability, prof sustainability professionals, impact investors, state and educational institutions to, you know, have, have, a, have a menu, have a list of menu mm -hmm. options when they try to uh, achieve something. There's not one great solution that's going to be able to be used or that's going to work in every urban setting. So the built environment is very important to our, uh, in our uh, perspective, even though, even though conservation is very important. Offshore wind farms, very important. I'm also involved in uh, conservation efforts all around. We believe that, you know, as the, uh, the, the world's human population increasingly lives in urban settings, that that is the place where the fight against biodiversity loss and climate change will mm. be lost or won. Simply because that's where most of the people live and most of the decision makers go home every day. Mm -hmm. So when, when you say a marketplace, you mean uh, physical products uh, or services or uh, what, what kind of things would you have there? All of those, all of those. We're aiming at bringing together the demand side I just mentioned and the solutions from ecopreneurs, uh, green business developers. Some of these are not, you know, clean tech founders of teams of three or four. These are sometimes mm. big companies that have excellent solutions. Uh, last time I checked, they were, there was no silver bullet in you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. helping us pull out from this uh, emergency, climate emergency. So we need more and more solutions available, readily available, you know, not ones that, you know, are still in the making, although those are very important. Research and development is very important. But we also need readily available solutions, services, products that a city can, you know, just pick up, take them from the shelf yeah. and implement tomorrow if they have the uh, resources and most importantly, the political will. I, I can see this being so important and so useful because at the moment, if you're, uh, let's say, uh, making a schedule of materials um, for a building, for a public realm, for something like that, it's it's you need to be, you know, there, there are people, sustainability consultants, and their whole job is to hunt down the products that fit um, the ambition of the project that have... Uh, the correct testing done to show their carbon footprint, to show they use non-toxic materials. It's very, very complex. Um, and I can imagine what, what the kind of industry is screaming out for is just give me one place to go to and tell me, um, uh, you know, show me very clearly that you meet the requirements that we have and then I can just, I can just purchase it. Yes, yes. And then, <clears throat> you know, coming from a, a STEM science-based uh, background, all of these, all of these uh, approaches and solutions need to be constantly revisited. Mm. You know, there, there might be some that, uh, let's say, typical example, biofuels, a couple of years ago, they were, you know, celebrated as the holy grail <laughs> of the solution. Nowadays, it's less murky. Same with the uh, garbage um, incinerators. Um, <clears throat> and today, we, 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 we um, we have found out that there are much better examples, much better solutions available, okay. and some are still in the making. You know, there are lots of questions about uh, carbon sequestration or uh, things like that. Um, you know, some of the things that are still in the uh, green hydrogen, another example. You ask some, you know, these are never going to be efficient, not scalable, not feasible. Mm. But let's give them some time. There are good solutions already available. We can't give up on, you know, research and development on others. But my, let me cite here my favorite saying from Lord Kelvin. You know Lord Kelvin, the uh, father of thermodynamics? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. From back in the uh, 19th century. Around 1885, he is quoted to have said, you know, heavier than air flying machines will never be possible. <laughs> and that was just 10 years removed from, from you know, the first flight actually oh wow Nancy. yeah so whatever whatever we look at and whatever we see today as the complete picture is com constantly changing yeah yeah so we never know yeah and i think there's something to be said that you know you use the best available product or technique for the time you're in but be open to sh to that shifting over time because things will get better um 
it's difficult it's difficult i think for professionals to stay on top of these things which perhaps is where your blog element comes in um because it's it it is just you know you learn a certain way of of doing something within your field and you maybe do that for a decade and then you're not necessarily keeping up with 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 the the cutting edge um so i think that communication aspect as well as the marketplace seems like a really i i can see where you're coming from with it, it sounds like a very good combination very very well said uh, we have we have examples i mean constant talks with uh, corporate sustainability professionals and they express they keep expressing doubts about let's say um carbon trading schemes and offsetting mechanisms and more and more of them would like to see concrete measurable impacts that they can track and monitor in time in many cases they want solutions that can be you know can be set up and implemented closer to where their customers actually live and that is the built okay. urban environments mm. so why uh, you mentioned earlier that you think cities urban centers are the um you know where the battle will be won or lost why what is your thinking on that because obviously you know so much only a fraction of, of the earth's surface is covered with with actual built environment much of it is wild much of it is agriculture so why focus on that um small amount of area that's urbanized it's interesting um the main reasons i think are that you know even though even despite the covid lockdown more and more people tend to move in and live in cities because that's where the jobs are and that's where they can make they can make you know, ends meet. And although cities only cover 3% of the world's area surface, uh, close to two thirds of the human population already lives there, mm. and it's ever growing. And this is where uh, a huge majority or about 70 80% of the total global GDP is produced. So, you know, even when even when uh, climate scientists tend to look at the major problems they say you know uh, when it comes to carbon emissions it's transport buildings agriculture in a way this is urban centers cities are the place where you know both the customers and when i say customers not, i don't mean it f- from just the uh, market econ- economy perspective but also in terms of climate awareness the customers mm-hmm. this is where the customers live this is where the decision makers, you know, also live and go home every day and they, you know, face the realities of uh, today's uh, climate emergency. So I think, and with some of my colleagues, we strongly believe that uh, even though there's not much in some cases that you can do in cities, every little bit counts, every square mm-hmm. meter of extra green surface every less piece of uh, plastic pollution every additional one percent of uh, you know energy efficiency or renewables in the energy mix counts huge it has a relatively much higher impact than uh, outside of the built environment and when i say built environment we actually work with uh, regenerative agroforestry as well so that's also mm. uh, it's it's probably i should say human altered environment mm. so it's, it's, not only, it's not only dense urban centers it's also rural towns villages and everywhere where people actually uh, modify their environment yeah yeah it's it's <clears throat> i suppose it's worth people bearing in mind that sometimes when you're when you're making interventions in cities like for instance, tree planting, planting street trees or planting pocket forests within cities, you know, the amount of carbon they will sequester is totally neg- negligible on the grand scale, but they have such a positive local impact. And the fact that cities are so dense, um, some more than others, you know, you know, you can improve the lives of many hundreds of thousands of people with quite a small scale intervention. So exactly. in that sense, it's a very, very important place to, to be doing these things. Exactly. And I would add that also the, um, it, it helps a lot to change the mindsets. When you, mm. when you pour a lot of money and efforts in conservation efforts, sometimes it's hard to uh, bring it back 
to um, to the actual population. It's hard to connect uh, back yeah. to people. You know, this is what is being done. It's very nice. Um, you know, ecotourism is nice. Many people like to go uh, outside to the, to nature to be connected to nature. But when it happens next door on their f- doorstep, next building or uh, at their workplace, mm. that's when they really feel the connection we found. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. There's that positive feedback loop of connection with nature and pro environmental behavior that is difficult to measure, but uh, you know we know exists. Yeah, and it's very important because you know just this week we are uh, living in a reality of uh, all the um, all the warning signs, all the warning uh, alarms are bleeping. You know, uh, the intergovernmental panel of uh, on climate change just released its latest findings that mm. we are in a very stark um, <clears throat> era where when uh, we cannot be talking about sustainability only that we are we are past that point right the climate emergency is here we need regenerative practices we need net zero is not going to cut it we need carbon negative mm. solutions and approaches that is also uh, i think very important yeah, we, we, we're, we're clearly, we've, we've, you know, seen this summer, especially, we're clearly experiencing the effects of climate change and things like the heat dome in Canada, that was outside of even the worst case scenario climate models. And now we're getting it and we're only at about 1.3 degrees of warming. So yep. that tells you how much worse things we'll get. Um, so I think you're right. Can you, can you explain to us this concept of, of a regenerative, I mean, we use this term in urban planning, regeneration, but it usually means knocking down some buildings and building some new buildings <laughs> doesn't necessarily always have a, pr- a positive environmental impact. Uh, what, what's your, uh, what's that concept about? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> in a, in a nutshell, uh, sustainability as opposed to sustainability, which is, you know, keeping uh, a low carbon footprint and uh, substituting as, uh, as many uh, polluting and uh, emitting solutions as possible. We need um, regenerative efforts in, this, in, the, in a way that, uh, you know, help restore original natural uh, biodiversity habitats. Mm-hmm. It needs to regenerate uh, the way we look at uh, agriculture. We need to regenerate the soil. We need, to, we need to regenerate our whole approach to the market economy. You know, we have, we have all lived in... Uh, in the market economy, you know, generations and generations have grown up thinking, you know, the way of uh, a pros- way to prosperity is the linear economy when you have to get, have to keep growing, you have to keep selling more, you have to keep consuming more. That has to give way to the circular economy where things get reused when no new uh, materials need to be extracted un- extracted mm. from the world from the from 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 the earth as much as possible we need to get back to we need to get the surface of the planet back to its natural stance as much as possible that's that's what i mean when it comes to uh, regenerative thinking yeah it's it's such an important um concept and i think it's a a word that we need to start using to replace sustainability in our discussions because actually when you when you really think about even though sustainability is something that we're still not doing most across most of you know the economy and our and our uh, society it's actually only the baseline it's really just saying let's keep things in stasis let's not get let things get any worse but we've already degraded the planet so much you know, the, 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 you have to step beyond that into the regenerative. And and really what this means, I mean, and the, the IPCC report said something to this effect, or maybe it was just the, the commentators I was looking at, that what we're looking at now in terms of solution is a, we need uh, nothing short of a total transformation of society will will deliver uh, us to a safe, uh, back into like sort of the safe planetary boundaries and, and to carbon zero is this where this idea of innovation comes in um we 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 i guess throughout many of my conversations on the podcast it's been a kind of a narrative that's been coming through which is many of the solutions we need we already have there requires 
uh, we can identify some innovations that are needed, which will make things easier, will make things more efficient. But also uh, in terms of technology, we'll say, um, but also there's this idea of innovation in our working practices, innovation in um, funding mechanisms and that kind of thing. And it isn't only about the physical, you know, the physical products. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what, what, what do you think of this, this issue of, of how do you foster innovation and how important is it? Yes, uh, to me, uh, in my in my experience, innovation is you know the one the type of uh, um, applied research and development that for which somebody actually pays at the end of the line. Uh, I'm uh, I'm all for you know charity solutions and uh, non governmental NGO uh, efforts to uh, clean the planet and to uh, <clears throat> restore nature. But at the end of the day, maybe unfortunately, maybe fortunately, innovation and business drives today's mm. economy. So we not only need, we not, not only need uh, nature-based solutions, bio-inspired mechanisms, eco-friendly approaches, but we need schemes that will actually stand on their feet, that will actually pay for themselves. There's a very important notion in many parts of the world that, you know, by going sustainable, or let's skip that word and going regenerative, mm. economies or businesses have to, uh, have to uh, give in and have to, you know, let some of their profits go. Or uh, there's yeah. a notion, there's, there's a notion that, you know, going, uh, going for the green recovery will end up costing us jobs. But if you really look into the details, innovation and the very well planned and implemented green recovery will actually create more jobs than the number that will be lost on the other end. There's also there's also already a very big shift happening, and it's a good thing, away from the fossil fuel economy. So, you know, big uh, <clears throat> investment groups are already divesting and already letting go some stranded assets. That's very good. But we, if, if, you know, if governments could really pressure some of these financial uh, me mechanisms and could you know, set incentives or policy guidelines that would uh, support innovative green solutions, it would actually benefit the economy. It would not only mm -hmm. benefit you know, the fight against climate change, against biodiversity laws, but it can actually have positive impacts on local economies, especially if, you know, you think about in the uh, circular you know, economy sense. And uh, that's, that's a really interesting point that, you know, business and we'll say profits and innovation go together. I think we could probably each name lots of examples of, we'll say, universities who who come up with something very innovative and then it sort of sits on a shelf because it doesn't have any any money or any business case behind it. Um, it's also interesting what you say about um, the incentives for innovation because I, I guess sometimes people don't realize that, you know, go, central governments incentivize the certain types of businesses that 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 flourish within a country and so around the world uh, national governments are incentivizing fossil fuel extraction through tax incentives unfortunately um, yes and that kind of thing also aviation fuel is taxed less uh, generally um, than you would expect and 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 so is is that is that part of the the puzzle of, of flipping these incentives and finding a way to get people innovating in the right direction rather than the wrong direction? Very much so. G give you an example. Back in the 90s, when uh, uh, the US government decided to uh, <clears throat> revolutionize uh, telecommunications and they decided, you know, wireless is going to be the uh, future, they changed a couple of uh, uh, policy regulations, laws uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the country. And on a federal level, uh, these changes resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars of investment mm. being shifted from the original way of telecommunications and going into wireless. And that's that's that the results we we already know. And you know that's part of the reason why these new innovative technologies 
technologies got off the ground and not only got off the ground, but really flourished uh, at the end of the uh, last millennia. You know, innovation has a tricky way of working when it when it's when it's a really good innovative idea that that that, that can go a long way, but it's very hard in the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. Just an idea or just a good team can get you so far. There's a term <clears throat> that they call the valley of death in the beginning, when you know you're already validating your idea, you're already building your team, you're already trying to get off the ground, but you do not have you you do not yet have a customer or a re- reliable stream of revenue. Mm. And that's also where governments or big financial mechanisms can come into play and you know kind of push push these uh, ecopreneurs, push these innovators over to the uh, to the to the good side of the uh, uh, valley of that when they don't already can you know stand on their feet. Environmentalists don't necessarily like to think in these terms, but how uh, profitable a green transition could actually be. If you look at um, investment funds, uh, many uh, investment funds now offer a uh, ethical or an eco option where they will not put your money into fossil fuels or um, companies with, with a bad pollution record, that kind of thing. And what I saw reported is one said that in the last couple of years, their um, ethical eco options have been outperforming their standard investment profiles. And so you start, you're start you starting to see the market shift. Uh, and I've also heard stories of uh, fossil fuel companies being refused loans for new um, oil wells and that kind of thing, because the banks uh, and the markets are saying, hold on, there's an expiry date on this industry we're starting to shift our money into the the more long-term options and it's that thing of like okay sustainability means you can you can keep something going don't you want to have a business that can keep going into the future why would you be investing money in something that will become obsolete in in 20 30 years time um so in very interesting to see the market shifting in that way absolutely absolutely and you know i'm i like to think of myself as the realistic um, environmentalist. Mm. Uh, I don't think you know the world is ready to you know give up, give, give uh, you know just get rid of fossil fuels overnight. And it's uh, it's only the uh, the fossil fuel giants that are to blame. I mean, they have their own employers, employees. They have their sh- shareholders. They have their own you know purposes, of course. But it's the governments. Who and the government policies that let them uh, continue on yeah. this path, and if there's a concert, concert, concerted effort from maybe not even national governments but the intergovernmental uh, organizations to keep nudging them towards the right direction, even even fossil fuel uh, companies can be can be our natural alliance can be can be natural allies in this fight. I mean, in some some cases, uh, BP or Shell are already doing more uh, investments into renewables than some other companies that deem themselves uh, sustainable already. So it's just, you know, people have to understand that as long as, as long as you're playing with people's livelihoods, there's going to be lots of resistance for change. Mm -hmm. Once you offer, once you offer a clear path of, you know, to the green recovery and, you know, there's jobs at the end of the tunnel and there's, things to do that will actually uh, help employees make ends meet at the mm. end of the month that's when we, we think we think that you know uh, real solutions will be uh, widely spread and widely uh, applied but you, you can look at um, you know the 1980s the Thatcher era in in uh, the UK where she shut down uh, coal you know steel plants and coal mines across the country and just you know very quickly without a smooth transition, and left a lot of um, cities, towns, and, and communities in total, you know, depression. People who were were suddenly unemployed with no uh, other skills, no other industry coming in. We, we can't, you know. And you could say, well, it's it's good now. The UK doesn't have so many coal mines, but you know, there was a uh, there would have been a more fair and just way of of doing that transition. Um, and we, I suppose, we can't 
as much as we might be angry at fossil fuel companies, we can't allow the same thing to happen because there is a human cost of just shutting down industries overnight. Very much so, very much so. Um, I don't know how much time you know we have to phase out these uh, technologies or uh, fossil fuels, but it's still the reality of the world. You know, millions and millions, or maybe billions of people are using uh, gasoline and diesel. Um, mm. And you know, we need to keep you know pushing for renewable uh, uh, electricity-driven options, but we just cannot you know let uh, these people fall off the cliff. Mm, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a, a very fair argument. Very, you know, it's, it's one side of 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 the reality of the situation. Um, I want to move on, ask you a bit about the technology side, and maybe you could tell us, you know, what are some of these innovations or these technologies that you are excited about and you think could be used more. Absolutely. Uh, besides besides the Green Urbanics uh, website, that's going to list a lot of these uh, categorized into you know, into uh, <clears throat> uh, the frag- in, in, into sections that the other uh, cities uh, operate in. We have also launched a, uh, a bi-monthly global virtual uh, business livecast series, event series. Mm. The first one was on June 24th. The second is going to be up in um, September the 15th. Check in if you have the time. Where we operate on the same concept as the website bringing together the demand side and the supply side we usually have you know presentations from uh, uh, green municipality office uh, officers corporate sustainability professionals and impact investors you know representing the demand side and we also have excellent pitches from uh, global innovators um, ecopreneurs and green business developers on the other side you know listing their good solutions in, in, in many, many areas that you can think of. Uh, my personal favorites are the low tech, the very, very low tech, you know, not all, mm. not all innovations have to be, you know, digital and uh, requiring deep tech understanding and knowledge. But also I like the ones that, you know, combine high tech with with uh, with uh, with simple solutions let me give you a couple of examples to the low tech mm. uh, when it comes to uh, cities one of the major problems uh, very much in connection with uh, the climate emergency is the urban heat islands and you know yeah. cities getting not only the countryside but also cities getting warmer and warmer and reaching getting to the point of uh, in in some cities in uh, in the tropics Sometimes it's uh, intolerable to, you know, be outside uh, between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. There are actually ancient architecture solutions, you know, known for thousands of years that people have used to mitigate the effects of these urban heat islands. Just think about latticed screens Mm. or buildings painted white in the Mediterranean. That's a great example, you know, buildings having huge thick walls and painted white on the outside you step inside and it's it can be at 15 20 degrees cooler than right. outside uh, again buildings just covered with uh, vegetation vines you know running uh, running on the uh, sides of the buildings or green roofs typical examples ancient times indians are known to employ cooling ponds on their buildings mm. you know using natural evaporation to uh, uh, to assist the cooling of buildings in some biophilic architectural approaches they use the wind and nature's others me other means of uh, regulating airflow into the be- building and through the building to keep the temperatures in check actually one of those solutions one of those excellent uh, architectural studios are going to be presenting on September the 15th. Oh, great. During one of these uh, uh, Green Urbanics Business Livecast events. So please make sure to uh, check in. Another example for low tech solutions is uh, the way we can save and protect pollinators. You know, just by not mowing your lawn that often, you know, keeping yeah. some patches, white flower patches at the end of your garden or on street corners that can make a huge impact on 
on the local uh, biodiversity. Reforestation is another method that is really, really low tech and can have a huge impact. But, but let me give you an, an extreme example also. Uh, in some, uh, in some uh, dense urban population centers, I know at least in Budapest, it's a huge problem around pubs and uh, places of uh, recreation and uh, you know concerts that uh, young uh, people going home tend to uh, <clears throat> relieve themselves in street corners and it just you know smells um, the were absolutely diverse especially when it uh, combines with heat there's a solution from the netherlands called green peas by the uh, company urban senses that they have these blocks of urinals that have plants on top and these are these are open-ended urinals that you can you can uh, use at the uh, back end and the company urban senses have a cooperation with the local uh, local water treatment facility they collect the urine every now and then and they use it uh, as a natural fertilizer so that's Brilliant. just that's just an ex- extreme example of a low tax approach <laughs> that is, I think, brilliant. And when it comes to high tech, uh, really, whatever whatever's um, you know pushing the envelope in science is already popping up in uh, in um, regenerative um, mm. solutions. There's some there's a, there's a Mexican company called Green Fluidics uh, who use algae strains algae strains and nanofluidics to help regulate building temperatures it's mm. like nanotechnology on steroids it's it's an ex- it's an excellent it's an excellent uh, excellent solution uh, they're still in the research phase and they have lots of questions still outstanding but if if the technology gets off the ground i have high expectations also there's uh, there's many ways that you can regulate energy efficiency in buildings using AI-supported uh, algorithms, AI algorithms, machine learning, to you know balance out the needs for cooling and uh, and heating. Um, we had the um, wonderful company Enerbrain, who is leading in this field, uh, present at one at at, at our last uh, uh, global event. <laughs> There's also AI technology in uh, Ran Marine's waste chart. It's a drone that uh, uses uh, machine learning to, you, you put it on a waterways and it keeps collecting garbage until the end of the day, until it gets filled up. It brings out the garbage, floating garbage, and empties it into a garbage bin. Besides floating and collecting garbage from the surface of the uh, water, it has a flying UAV drone component up in the air that also uses AI to pinpoint, you know, where uh, the patches of plastic are floating oh, on, the, right. on, the, on the water. And it helps direct the swimming part towards the garbage. Also, very much uh, a great, great uh, use of uh, IoT, uh, you know, Internet mm. of Things sensor technology yeah. is uh, applied in uh, indoor farming and uh, precision agroforestry. You know how important food security is. Mm-hmm. Now, when you can combine it with the latest technology, it's you know it it doesn't only give you the option to control, let's say your your uh, the growth of your strawberries in your basement. You know you can use your smartphone and you know uh, input uh, whether you want uh, bigger or fresher or uh, sweeter strawberries at the end of the week. That's just one aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But you can also regulate uh, the use of energy and the use of, even more importantly, the use of water water in uh, precision indoor farming. And it's, um, it's not yet uh, wide scale uh, as much as we would like, but I think it's also part of the future because just as much uh, you know, uh, clean energy water is a very important limiting factor and it's increasingly it increasingly plays into uh, uh, the economics of food production and food security sometimes with these indoor farming solutions you can use 99 95 percent less 
water wow. um, than in open fields. So that, that's going to be huge, Incredible. I think, in a couple of years. Another example for high tech. Nowadays, you can have a new technology, perovskite-based transparent solar films, you know, that you can just print out from a printer. You can put it on your window, any window, basically, in residential areas, in urban centers. And it, uh, while, you know, uh, allowing sunshine to come into the rooms, at the same time, it generates clean energy. Wow. So I, uh, my personal favorites are the combination of low-tech and the high tech. It's it's some of the sometimes I, I I hear about innovations like this or I actually see them in real life and I do think to myself, okay, we are living in the future now. <laughs> you know, it is some of it does seem like magic. You know, it's it's really incredible. Um, I I appreciate also hearing about the low tech stuff. Um, thinking about the pollinators as well. I mean, I on my street here, I'm in pretty inner city London here. Um, my street has recently just been redesigned and they've added in planters uh they've added in one street tree and a couple of planters with uh lavender and thyme and a couple of other plants it looks great it looks fantastic and the first week it was there i was walking down and i saw a single bumblebee on one of the lavender piece of lavender and i thought oh amazing pollinators this is this is brilliant uh we're getting uh you know bees back we never have bees on the street the last two weeks, I was just in the south of France visiting my parents uh, who live there, and they live in a, in a kind of rural environment. They have a, uh, a small wooded area at the back of their house, and at the front, they have planted a big row of lavender. And I went there one morning, and it was like 40 bees just <laughs> having a great time in the lavender. And I thought that that created such a contrast for me, and I, I realized how um, degraded cities are uh, and how, you know, what what would be more normal would be a lot more insects flying around, you know, and not just the bees. They also had tons of moths and grasshoppers and butterflies and all these incredible stuff I'd never seen um, because it was like an ecologically rich and diverse place. And then you contrast that to the city where, you know, if you see one insect on your street, it's kind of an event. Um, so, yeah, really, really interesting. And to be honest with you, London is among the better places. London mm. already has a great... Um... A great uh, policy f- framework, uh, recommend a set of recommendations for how to um, build greener. Uh, London has excellent green roofs. You know, not only yeah. When, when you when you uh, look at the uh, you know uh, the European Federation of uh, Green Roofs, uh, Green Roof Associations, to be honest, to, to be more precise, they have some green roofs that are mimicking, you know, uh, natural biodivers, naturally biodivers habitats, but they not only have pollinators, you know, flocking there, but in some cases, migratory birds, rare endangered Uh, birds stopping for a rest and stopping to check out. And this is how, this is how nature works. It's not going to, they're not going to come back. Wildlife is not going to come back overnight, Uh, Mm. but slower, sooner or later, they're going to, uh, you know, take back the areas that we uh, city dwellers have taken from them. Um, very, there's a very important concept in ecology called, uh, you know, not only biodiversity loss, but habitat degradation and fragmentation. So mm. in some cases, a very little um, reconnection with nature, ecological corridors can play huge, huge roles in helping to regenerate uh, natural processes and complex ecosystems, they're not. There may, they're, you know, in the cities, there may not be the places where, you know, we're going to have um, uh, jungle life uh, overnight. But you know, these small t- steps can make a, can can go a long way to uh, helping restore nearby ecosystems. Yeah, and 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 sometimes that means actually humans stepping away and doing less so so recently i've seen much more this year in my local park and the local green spaces they've just they have they've stopped mowing the lawns which is some of them anyway and it's it's brilliant they've just grown into meadows and they look fantastic they give a real like soft semi-wild kind of feeling to the edge uh of the street or the edge of the park and of course they're just so you know infinitely better 
and you just let nature do what it wants with it then you don't you know try and force it absolutely um before i move on to the final question uh i just want to check with you if there's any other topics you want to bring up uh while i have you here yes please allow me to mention a couple of uh, you know a couple of um, innovative green solutions that cannot be or that are hard to be you know hard to categorize into mm. the usual low tech high tech uh, building energy efficiency wastewater treatment um, green surfaces and and whatnot some of these solutions actually work to change the mindsets uh, yeah. and that, that is just as important as the, the the physical things that you can see on the street or the urban planning methods or the uh, natural restoration projects that you can experience let me give you an example uh, there's a there's a there's a great group from the uk from ireland called evoco and what they're doing is creating a smartphone app that you can take it with yourself with you uh, when you do your shopping and it gives you feedback and it gives you um, great insight into the carbon footprint of what you're buying and you know they're gamifying it and they're they're making it easily understandable but at the end of the day if, if you know solutions like this spread out this might not only change the perspective that consumers have i mean they can choose between two chips you know this one's gonna have this much carbon footprint this one this one is gonna be using palm oil so i'm gonna stay away from that one and mm. i'm going to use the one that might be a little bit more expensive but a lot better for the environment but at the end of the value chain these are these have the potential to affect uh, production as well these might you know if if many if, if enough customers uh, consumers would be using these we're, we're using these this could actually affect the bottom line of corporates producing environmentally mm. harmful uh, products and shift away from those and change their ways there's also another there's also another group um, um, in the uk and the netherlands i think they have uh, uh, double uh, teams they have teams in both countries called in chain who are also building an app that helps you track the environmental impact of products in the value chain so not only not only not only the uh, the end product how much uh, how much uh, it hurts or harms the environment but it goes all the way and helps businesses as well track how you know how they can improve on the uh, regenerative efforts along the whole value chain of their uh, production and distribution lines there's also a great uh, great uh, startup emerging from the US called Ucapture. What they're doing is educating and nudging corporates in their finances in you know how to how to channel their uh, corporate ESG and sustainability efforts towards more sustainable and more regenerative uh, uh, ways of working. There's also excellent. There's also there's also an excellent uh, Australian startup called Reforest, by a gentleman named Daniel Walsh, who who are turning the whole carbon offset, carbon offsetting playbook on its head. Mm -hmm. You know, in in many cases, uh, uh, corporate and other carbon trading and offsetting schemes have lost some of their credibility because it's hard to track you know what happens with my money if i you know click that button yes i mm. would like to you know plant a tree virtually somewhere way outside of um, my reach or my my, my vision uh, <clears throat> many in many cases offset mechanisms end up flowing towards uh, the cheapest the most cost effective mm. uh, ways of you know uh, creating creating value creating green value somewhere way outside of my of my uh, <clears throat> of my eyesight and these guys these these um, <clears throat> innovators bring back uh, the notion of ownership and shared responsibility for you know customers 
but also playing together or working together hand in hand with their with with, with corporates that are actually producing uh, the things that consumers buy, and together <clears throat> they can they can uh, follow how those uh, green uh, dollars or uh, euros are being spent and monitor actually see you know take a virtual tour mm. what happens with their uh, green investments yeah the the accountability is is so important i'll i'll give another nod to uh, a company called mossy earth uh, who are really good i actually had um one of their ecologists uh, tiago on the podcast uh, a couple of months ago and um they i guess they do a similar approach they they go out and they do the planting but they report on every aspect of the project that they're working with. They tell you who they're partnering with. When they actually plant the trees, they take photos of every single sapling um, that your money goes towards, and you can access that. You see a GPS location of all the saplings, photograph, uh, and they're always emailing you know, once a week or whatever, telling you, updating you on the projects and what they're doing. So you know exactly you pay a membership of like £10 a month. You know exactly where your money is going, that it's being put to good use um and that the all the projects are properly managed you know so yeah it, it, we need more of that for sure yeah and these are excellent examples of long-term thinking which is i think very mm. important in this aspect you know in in in, in the past uh, offsetting carbon offsetting schemes had uh, you know n- did not require the uh, <clears throat> the uh, addition of the element it did some in some cases there was some uh, you know schemes where you could actually pay for a certain natural uh, habitat not to get destroyed you know but who says you know who says for how long or maybe you know we saved this patch of uh, of a natural rainforest and what happened was you know they took it to across the street or across the river and they were cutting mm. down another one or they you know yeah. your your uh, green investment or green dollars would uh, go for um saving a part of a forest but for how long maybe after three to five years you know everything goes back to normal and that's just not sustainable again we need long-term thinking and holistic integrative approach in this um the final question that i ask all guests come on the podcast and i always get a different answer is uh we're obviously at a pivotal moment in terms of taking action on climate change and achieving our targets what, from your perspective, what do you think needs to happen or change over the next decade? And it could be that you've already answered that over the course of the, the conversation, but I'll just give you a chance to uh, make a final point there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this question. Well, to sum up, I, I truly believe that, you know, there will not, not be a single bullet, a single solution, a single technology mm-hmm. saving us. Uh, we're going to need... Um, everybody on this planet that we share thinking in one direction uh, we're going to need uh, to accelerate the shift from a fossil fuel based linear economy to a cleaner circular economy that's for sure for that to happen we cannot rely on businesses alone there's going to be there's going to need to be a concerted governmental or even even uh, intergovernmental uh, policy frameworks pushing businesses and consumers and everybody else to go in that direction. We need to get really, we need to really fast. We need to get the major polluters in check, you know, transport, industry, agriculture, Mm -hmm. buildings, you know, the ones that emit the most. And it's very important that besides carbon emissions, which are undoubtedly the the most pressing um, problem, the planet faces we need to simultaneously look at and deal with uh, the little siblings of uh, carbon emissions and um, like biodiversity loss plastic pollution ocean acidification soil erosion or even the ingrained human forced labor in the value chains mm. and the beauty the beauty of these many of these innovative green urban solutions is that Many of these solutions tackle more than one problems at the same time. Right. So we need to get uh, we need to get from an activist mindset to while not neglecting that we need to get into 
we need to embrace these approaches and these solutions as an everyday part of life. You know, mm. nowadays it's normal to think, you know, nobody's going to go out on their field and, you know, sprinkle DDT or use frown, mm. uh, um, you know, um, <clears throat> ozone degrading uh, materials in the refrigerator. We need to keep pushing these envelopes and we need to keep, you know, heading into a direction when in, let's say, five to ten years from now, clean energy will be the normal. And mm. and these innovative green solutions will be the ones that will act as a baseline and we can improve from there. That's great. That's great. That's really well said. Thank you so much, Balaj. This has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, where can people find out more about you and, and your work online? Thank you so much for the time. It was uh, it was an excellent uh, discussion. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for doing this in in uh, you know in the long term. You could, because I'm not the only one you are interviewing. So please keep up the good work and uh, keep finding uh, um, <clears throat> all the uh, all the people that have uh, have uh, solutions um, in their pockets. Um, about green urbanics, you can find it on uh, www.greenurbanics.com. Uh, uh, I also uh, post a lot of things uh, and uh, a lot of my thoughts and a lot of our colleagues' uh, findings and experiences on LinkedIn. And uh, happy to see you and uh, all others interested in this uh, topic at the uh, bi-monthly uh, virtual global uh, business livecast series. It's usually every two months. And the last one was June 24th. Next one is September the 15th. Check out some of the best solution providers from uh, across the globe where can people get access to registering for that is that on your website as well same yes on the website yeah. greenurbanics.com great well i will be there for one and hopefully some more listeners can also join us uh thank you we'll leave it there thank you so much have a, rest, a great rest of the week